Hi everybody, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classic's Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. Our mission is not to further vilify these teams or individuals, but instead to challenge the conventional wisdom and re-examine what has been accepted as fact. In this show, we'll count down the reasons why you can't blame the Portland Trailblazers for drafting Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan. It seems so obvious now. But in the early 1980s, Portland was a perennial playoff contender, but one that had slipped from its championship level of 1977. In 1984, it had the second pick in a draft absolutely loaded with talent. The choices made at the top of that draft would have a tremendous effect on NBA history and on each franchise involved for more than a decade to come. Up court to Michael Jordan. There's Michael Jack Knight. Elijah Wan with a great rebound. Oh, there's Barkley. That was one of the best drafts in uh, NBA history. Obviously, you know, you had Elijah Wan and Jordan and Sam Bowie and Charles Barkley. It was a terrific draft. They used to have the show Let's Make a Deal, and they had three boxes. Which box do you want to pick? And it was like there was a Cadillac behind box number two. And yet the stupid idiot general manager goes, I'll take box number one. Portland draft from the University of Kentucky, Sam Bowie. Sam Bowie? Give me a freaking break. After Houston began the day by selecting Akeem Olajuwon, Portland picked Sam Bowie, and the greatest player of his time, perhaps any time, was chosen by Chicago. The break to Michael Jordan. You can't blame the Blazers for not drafting Jordan because somebody was stupid enough not to recognize his talent and what his potential was. You got two surefire, can't miss players, and you end up with a guy, good player, good guy but he's not going to be in that top 50 rack. Uh, you have to think that. There was some sort of mistake made there. But you don't pass up on a Michael Jordan to take a Sam Bowie. Well, I'm looking very forward to playing with the Portland Trailblazers. When people looked at it, they looked at Dr. Jack Ramsey. They looked at everybody within the Blazers organization, and they said, hell, we should have fired them twice. Portland coach Jack Ramsey and general manager Stu Inman knew talent. They had built a championship team by making smart draft choices. But in 1984, they strayed from their basic approach. This franchise had been emphatic about drafting the best player available, no matter the position. And had they stuck to that, I think they would have taken Michael Jordan. That was the classic NBA thing. When you don't know what else to do, draft the biggest guy available. Nobody will ever question me if I take the big guy. Well. Yes, they will, if you miss on Michael Jordan. He came in and, and took the league by storm his rookie year and never stopped. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I'd look in the box scores and I'd see where I had 11 points, Michael had 60, and people say, wow, they had a chance to draft Jordan and they took Bowie. As much of the sports world knows, Jordan won 10 scoring titles and six championship rings with the Bulls. By comparison, Bowie was a monumental bust for the Blazers, spending much of his five seasons with them on the injured list. His injury record was really scary. He'd missed two full seasons with injuries, but they had to know they were taking a gamble with his brittle bones. There was always something brittle about Sam Bowie's game, and a guy with those kinds of Physical ailments is almost by definition going to be brittle. Jordan had this great career, and Sam Bowie had almost an injury-prone, non-existent career. The public feels that if we had Michael Jordan, would we have won six championships? Michael Jordan in Portland, everything would be different here. The identity of the city would just be a little different. There's no statue of Michael Jordan in front of the Rose Garden. We admit, it is tantalizing to think about a Portland team that had Clyde Drexler, Jerome Kersey, Terry Porter, and Michael Jordan. Trailblazer fans would be counting the championships. But we're here to assert that you can't blame the Blazers for drafting Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan. Before we get to our top five reasons why Portland has gotten a bum rap, let's take a look at some additional points in its favor. We call them the best of the rest. 
the coin flip. The Rockets and the Blazers, who obtained the pick from Indiana in a 1981 trade for Tom Owens, flipped for the first selection in 1984. Both teams had their sights set not on Jordan, but Olajuwon. I was hoping and praying that we'd win the flip, because we had to call. I blame it on the coin flip. I don't know who told them numerically it was going to come up tails, what seance they went to, any place that tells fortunes, you got to blame it on that. On the way to the coin flip, our owner, Mr. Weinberg, was flipping the coin numerous times, and just before he went into the building, he flipped it and it came up tails, and he decided that's what he would call. Almost any coin flip in which I've been involved automatically uh, calls heads. <laughs> Uh, Larry called tails, and uh, the rest is history. Had Portland gotten Elijah on, there wouldn't be the conversation about Michael Jordan, no matter what he did. In a coin flip for the number one pick in 1972, the Blazers correctly called tails and selected LaRue Martin, who had averaged five points over four seasons. The blame goes to calling tails. That's where it gets right down to. If it didn't work for Rulu Martin, you should have switched, switched strategies. Another best of the rest, Patrick Ewing's mother. She's not entirely blameless. Ewing had made a promise to his mother that he was going to get his Georgetown degree, and he did get his Georgetown degree in four years, as promised, and he was not going to leave that program. Patrick elected not to come out. So that put us with Sam. We would have gone Hakeem, Patrick, Sam in that order. We had hoped that Ewing was going to come out that year. I wish he'd have come out, because then it would have been easy if you lost Elijah when you take Ewing. We'd have been happy with either one of them. Our final best of the rest, the Rockets. They also passed on Jordan. Why don't people blame the Houston Rockets for taking Hakeem? Did Hakeem win as many championships as Michael Jordan? No. So, you know, Houston must be just as stupid as Portland. If Michael Jordan hadn't taken a couple years to go try baseball, I'm not convinced Elijah Wan would have ever won championships, thereby justifying somehow his pick as the number one player in the draft. Every team that looked back had the opportunity to take Michael Jordan, uh, said they blew it. Reason number five, the draft is a crapshoot. We got human beings trying to judge other human beings, and both are fallible. It's not an exact science, selecting players. There's a gamble with whomever you take. The Blazers, ironically, were one of the best drafting teams of that era. Nine of the 12 players on their 1977 championship team were drafted by the Blazers. In the nine drafts that followed, Portland made their share of bad picks, but also selected three players, Clyde Drexler, Jerome Kersey, and Terry Porter, who would become the foundation of a team that reached the NBA Finals twice in the early 90s. Stu Inman had the ability to go to a former girls' school in Virginia and find Jerome Kersey, to grab Terry Porter out of Wisconsin Stevens Point. They had a great intuitive sense for talent made a lot more right decisions than wrong. I would match our draft picks over the years with anybody's. This is a franchise that has a tremendous track record. And then to say that because they missed one guy that it put a, a curse on the franchise, I think, is totally unfair. Before we get to reason number four, let's take a look at how the 1984 draft impacted the future. Well, 1984 was the pivotal year that set up the whole lottery system. Uh, that was the year that Houston decided to uh, go on a downward spiral. After winning the first overall pick in 1983, the Rockets selected Ralph Sampson. But late in the next season, they slumped badly, losing 27 of their last 36 games. Some cried foul. Far be it from me to be the guy who said that Houston tanked a few games to get into that slot of getting to the coin flip and having a chance at the number one pick again. When you had fans come into the arena you know, at every game with signs, you know, wanting a lodge run, it wasn't too hard to figure out what the right business decision was. I don't think we played the way we probably could have to go and win more games. I think, you know, played for, I think, the first pick. At the owners meeting that June in 84, no committees formed this time. Boom. 
That's the end of the coin flip. The lottery was instituted immediately. Reason number four, size matters. Until Jordan changed the game, an NBA tenet was you can't win a championship without a dominant big man. From 1959 to 1980, there were 21 MVPs. 20 of them were centers. It was pretty much uh, accepted theory that uh, you couldn't win a championship without a good big man. What Russell, Chamberlain, Jabbar, Bellamy, Nate Thurman did, it elevated that position. When you have players like that and you don't have one, then you have a real problem. The theory still stands that if there's a big man available, uh, that's your franchise player. In 1984, the Blazers were merely following conventional wisdom by picking Bowie instead of Jordan. In the previous 26 seasons, only one team, the 1975 Warriors with Clifford Ray, had won the championship without a star center. The Blazers were coming off a decade of getting their brains beat in by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar down in L.A. I mean, the conventional wisdom at that time was, you have to have the big guy in the middle or you're never going to get there. Everybody was trying uh, whatever they could to get another big man or to get some way to defend uh, Kareem and to slow down the uh, Lakers at that time. With Abdul-Jabbar still going strong and the Twin Towers looming in Houston, there was every reason to think big was better. Wow. Everybody loves to talk about the preening pretty boys on the perimeter. It's still a game that's dominated by men who make their name in the paint. To me, that's a no-brainer. You need a seven-footer. Sam Bowie's the biggest seven-footer you have available at the time. You know, so you got to roll with it. Another factor that played into the Blazers' pick of Bowie was the memory of letting Moses Malone go even before he played a game. Portland acquired him in the 1976 ABA dispersal draft. But with Bill Walton in tow, the front office felt they didn't need a second multi-skilled center. Yeah, I wish we'd have kept Moses Malone. That was a serious mistake. They trade Moses Malone to the Buffalo Braves for a first-round draft pick. And days later, the Buffalo Braves traded him to Houston for two first-round draft picks. If they had traded me and kept Moses, that team would have had untold championship banners. Basketball's favorite deadhead, Bill Walton. You can blame me for just about everything. Late in the 1978 season, a year after the California Redwood from Westwood led Portland to an NBA title, Walton's career was stalled by stress fractures in the feet. The Blazers were desperate to regain their past glory. Once they had Walton, they wanted more Waltons. Good passing centers are not easily come by. Sam possessed uh, a lot of those skills, and at seven foot, he could uh, see the court pretty well and deliver a ball, as Walton did. Great pass by Tony Award. But if Portland hoped for the second coming of Walton, they were blind to the downside possibilities both players shared. In his second season, the seven foot one center's legs began to break down. And over the next four years, he missed 265 regular season games. Most people look in and say, well, both of them had injuries that kind of kept them from uh, really going a lot further in their careers. They got the one really good complete season out of Bill before injuries took him away. They never got the one really good season out of Sam Booth. I'm not one to point the finger, but I uh, had some major injuries that obviously restricted me from reaching my full potential. Bowie's physical problems began while he was at Kentucky, where he missed two full seasons. He had suffered certainly a, a very serious leg fracture. Um, he was locked up really in plaster for 42 plus weeks. It was an extremely rare form of tibial fracture, and we found only 16 cases of that particular fracture worldwide. And the majority were in male ballet dancers. Stu Inman uh, spent an awful lot of time in uh, Kentucky uh, talking to their medical people, and we also had our people uh, look at him. 
the consensus from everybody was that uh, he had a good, uh, predictable future in the NBA. Sam had his physical and passed with flying colors. It was just one of those things that happens. After both were named to the all-rookie team, it was Jordan and not Bowie who went down early in his second season with an injury. He broke a bone in his foot and missed almost a whole year. A lot of people were looking like, wow, I'm glad we drafted Bowie instead of Jordan. Unfortunately, Jordan got healed, very much so, and, and Sam kept continuing to have his difficulties. We just couldn't depend on him because of the health problems. It wasn't anything to do with Sam. It was just his body just didn't have it. We were awfully good, and I think had he not gotten hurt, uh, it would have been very, very interesting. If he just stayed injury free, I mean, we'd have, we'd have definitely won some more championships in Portland. Sam Bowie was a very promising player, but sadly, like way too many Blazer centers, his leg just wouldn't hold up. Reason number two, Dean Smith. I really blame Dean Smith because if Dean Smith would allow Michael to have averaged 40, it wouldn't have been no secrets. That's always the running, you know, running joke was Dean was the only guy to hold him under 20 points. He got hit on Dean Smith's team a little bit because they're so team oriented. North Carolina had a host of guys that were playing under their ability and the pro game sprung them and they turned out to be great pros. But you, you didn't know that Jordan was going to be that same kind of guy. Jordan averaged 17.7 .7 points per game in his three seasons at North Carolina. Although he was named College Player of the Year as a junior in 1984, it would have taken extra sensory perception to predict his future. Anyone that says uh, they knew from the beginning that Michael Jordan would be the greatest player ever really didn't know what they were talking about. Michael was not LeBron James. Michael was not somebody who everybody said was God's gift to the game of basketball. Let's face it, he could barely hit a 12-footer when he came to the NBA and could barely dribble with his left hand. It's easy for us to sit back and say, oh boy, you guys are really idiots, but, you know, I think uh, Michael really hadn't emerged as a dominant player. Even though they had selected Jordan with their first pick, the Bulls were disappointed. GM Rod Thorne admitted as much when he apologized to Chicago fans. You know how Rod Thorne built the team by accident? He didn't want Michael Jordan. He wanted the big man. There was sentiment in the organization. Hey, we have a lot of guards. We really need a center. Should we trade down and take a guy like Mel Turpin or somebody else? Our feeling was that, you know, Jordan is potentially a very fine NBA player, but to think he would turn out to be what he turned out to be, I, I wish I were prescient enough to you know, to have thought that at the time. To the city of Chicago, thank God you drafted me instead of Portland. If I was general manager of the Portland Trailblazers and I knew Mike was going to have the career that he had, I'd have drafted Mike before Sam Bowie. Every time I see Mike, it's his fault because nobody knew he was going to be as good as he turned out to be. Reason number one, Clyde Drexler. His presence meant the Blazers had no need for Michael Jordan. I thought it was a logical choice. Uh, we needed a center. We had Clyde Drexler. Clyde was just as good as anybody. So there was, there was no really uh, rush for him to go out and get a, a two guard. You can't sit Michael Jordan on the bench, right? <laughs> they thought Jordan was like an imitation Drexler. Why do we need two guys like that? And there's no balance in getting two players playing the same position to do the exact same thing at the same time. One of them's going to eventually have to go. So they did the smart thing in drafting Sam Bull. Drexler wasn't the Blazers' only talented guard. The man he played behind, Jim Paxson, was fresh off a season in which he averaged 21 points per game. It wasn't even an argument. Uh, when Jordan's name came up, uh, Stu said, you know, he's going to be a real good player in the NBA. But when, when you already have Paxson and Drexler, you need a center. People were thinking that, you know, you guys have a great team. All you need is a big man. Often buried in the blaming of Portland for picking Bowie over Jordan is the memory of an athlete with outstanding potential. 
Sam has been brilliant. He's got great mobility, he's agile, he runs the floor well, and he's got great range as a shooter. When you look at a specimen like that, any management team would have taken Sam Bowie uh, over Michael. If I was in Portland's place, absolutely had him taken Bowie. It didn't work out, but they, you can't fault the, the Portland Trailblazers. Knowing what everybody knew, you can't fault them for taking Bowie. Any other general manager or coach who says it was a mistake, they wouldn't have done it, is probably not telling the truth. Would the Blazers have become a dynasty with Jordan and Drexler sharing the ball? Yeah, probably, but we'll never really know. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for watching.